the next speaker. He is also the chairman of this event, Dr. James Wee, obtained his MD degree in National Yangming University and PhD in Zhongshan uh, Medical University. After training in rheumatology and clinical immunology at Taichung Veteran General Hospital and the Kaohsiung Veteran General Hospital, he undertook a fellowship at the Royal National Hospital for Rheumatic Disease in Bass, UK, under the supervision of Professor Andrew Carlin and a research fellowship at the University of California, Los Angeles, and the Professor David e. investigating the clinical and the pathogen spondyl arthropus. Uh, after speed, there's five, five minutes for Q&A. Uh, his talk today is clinical and imaging diagnosis of SPOT. Welcome, Professor Wei. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhou. Um, Professor Zhou is always my mentor during my career. Thank you. And thank you for all of you coming to Taichung and Taiwan. And we have actually 500 registration over the world online. So let me show you our famous salmon lake in the background. And I'm from Zhongshan Medical University, similar to Zhongshan, but different, okay? Zhongshan Medical University is located in Taichung. Taichung is the second biggest city, as you can see, Taiwan is, is a small but beautiful Formosa island. So if you drive from Taichung to the high mountain area, you only need one hour to the Salmon Lake or Ali San or even the Jade Mountain. So I wish in the near future, I can treat you in person in Taichung. And my talk today is the clinical and image diagnosis of Axial Spa. And I'll end by a take home message by a practical guideline. So as many speakers um, talk about this morning that SPA is actually a spectrum of disease with overlapping symptoms. Although we classify to AS or PSA or even reactive arthritis IBD, but actually the symptom is usually uh, coexistent and overlapping. But the four main clinical feature is spinal, pain or stiffness. That's why we call spondyloarthropathy and also peripheral pain from peripheral arthritis or encephalitis, causing from knee or Achilles tendon or plantar fascia. And 40% of them have extra articular manifestation, mainly uveitis and psoriasis. Actually 20% of them have uveitis and another 10 of them have psoriasis. So, so this is really a complex disease. It's a chronic multi-system and lifelong disease. So let's start from the spinal pain. This is the hallmark of the symptom of SPA. So we have three classification criteria only for classification. I personally um, like entry cutting criteria that you just ask four or five simple questions for age of something age of onset less than 40 years old, and for duration for more than three months, and for onset should be insidious onset. And then you got to have morning stiffness, which is the earlier sign of SPA, and also the improvement with exercise, which can differentiate from mechanical back pain. So if we have four positive over those five items, then it, it called IBP is present, and you should suspect axial spa then you should do physical examination. For the medical student, you just simply do the finger to floor at your clinic. So it's just ask a patient to bend in forward and normally the fingertips should be within 10 centimeter to the floor. But this is not a very accurate because there's many false positive and also false negative. So we recommend in clinical trial, we do Schober test or modify Schober you just mark a 10 centimeter two point, then bending forward, then the distance should be increased for at least five centimeter. So if positive, then you can show the spinal motility is limited. Then you should do some examination over peripheral joint and incisus. As Steph now shown, the PSA have more uh, peripheral manifestation like encephalitis over a tendon and also dactylitis over your fingers or toes. And these are typical and maybe up to 40% of them have a peripheral 
manifestation. So be careful, uh, be careful about the EAM, that is extra articular manifestation, because if you don't ask the patient, the patient won't tell you, okay? But actually it's also due to SPA. So most of them have uveitis and then psoriasis and even IBD and even combination of those symptoms. And finally, we have a reactive arthritis, which Professor Tsai just mentioned about. Actually, it's a, a post-infection autoimmune phenomenon. And most of them have mucosa manifestation like genital ulcer, banalitis, or like urethritis or um, conjunctivitis. And some of them even have a skin lesion, very like psoriasis, but we call uh, keratoderma brenorragica. So those are all mixed features of spondyloarthritis. In my center, we also do some long-term association of complication or the other comorbidity. So we have a database of National Taiwan Insurance, as you know, you can follow the patient up to 14 years. And we do demonstrate that even in Taiwan, the IBD is not so rare. You can see about 2% of them might have IBD in the future in patients with AS, which is quite high compared to the normal control. And we can also look at the other GI manifestation like IBS, which is very, very common in, in patients with axial spa. We can also show the Kaplan-Meier and also show the hazard ratio for up to 2.4 times compared to the normal, uh, normal population. And we also look at the fibromyalgia. Okay, this is very, very uncommon in patients with axial spa. Actually, you need to do the differential diagnosis. So we also show that um, most of the patients will develop fibromyalgia in the long run, uh -huh, up to 6%, especially in patients with diabetes and also gout or depression. And this is also a, a paper by Shuo Yan, okay, our medical student. Actually, all my articles showing today are also are all done by, by our medical student team. And finally, we also look at the valvular heart disease. We all know this is a rare association, but actually it's not so rare. If you look at the longitudinal um, cohort study in Taiwan, we can show a clearly higher hazard ratio of all valvular heart disease, including tricuspid, including aortic or mitral. You can also show a higher incidence of valvular replacement surgery in patients with AS. So again, AS is a multi-system disease from head to foot. You can see every kind of manifestation, including skin, joint, vessel, and GU tract, and GI tract, and even um, eye condition, and also IBD, et cetera. So it really needs to do a very detailed physical examination and also history taking to make a precision diagnosis. So the summary of my first part is that you need to correct all relevant parameters for clinical diagnosis including IBD and drug response to NSAID and peripheral arthritis or encephalitis, also ductilitis. You also need to collect family history of every kind of SPA, including psoriasis. And you can ask for preceding infection, especially from GI or GU tract. Then you also can do some um, testing, especially HLA B27. We also do ESR CRP for disease activity measurement, but not for baseline diagnosis only. And finally, you still need to some uh, image tools to confirm your diagnosis, which I'll talk about this later. So the summary slide of this part is that we have concept of a spectrum of disease, but we practically divide only two category, that is axial or peripheral spa and each have a different classific classification criteria for clinical use. You can see AS for modified New York. You can see axial spa for 
uh, here 2009, and we also have a peripheral bar 2011. But the bottom line is those classification criteria is only used for clinical research, not for clinical diagnosis. And the clinical diagnosis of SPA should, again, based on collection of clinical features and a concept of likelihood, not a single biomarker. The second part is the image tool, which is most important in most rheumatic diseases, especially in SPA. So again, this is a spectrum of disease and slowly progressive. So we need to def uh, diagnose this earlier in this stage we call non-radiographic axial spa, not the end stage. In the very late stage, we call bamboo spine. That is always too late. So the emerging of MRI or other modality is quite uh, important in our clinical practice. So that's why we have a consensus two years ago by Professor Tsai, who is the chairman, or who is the, the president of our the Rheumatology Association, we published the data about clinical practice recommendation and imaging in diagnosis two years ago in IJRD. So I'll go through very briefly about each image modality. The essential is conventional radiography. So we recommend you should do conventional radiography for SI joint by either pelvis or KUB. And sometimes you can use the Ferguson view, that is the angle view for the SI joint, plus lumbar spine as ray so that you can make a baseline diagnosis in each patient with chronic back pain for more than three months. We have grading for conventional X-ray, but this is very subjective. Subjective by um, minimal or unequivocal or severe. So there's no clear cut but I'll show you the typical image from the official website of ASAS. So you, you can download freely on the website. This is normal SI joint where you can see the clear joint space and regular margin without sclerosis, okay? But again, you need to have a different angle to view the SI joint. Sometimes you have normal variation, especially in the juvenile type. For grade two and grade one, again, it's very subjective. Right side, you can see the grade two sacral ileitis with suspicious or moderate subchondral sclerosis and a little bit irregular joint space, which means only erosion. For grade one, on the left-hand side, you can see very little. So just a um, suspicious, we call grade one. And for grade three, it's a definite here, the subchondral sclerosis or joint erosion or even the joint space narrowing. And you can see sometimes the typical erosion in bilateral sacroiliac joint. And for stage four, grade four, that will be a ankylosis, means a bony fusion of both bilateral SI joint. So again, the SI joint is very subjective and sometimes disagreement between readers exist. So that's why we need classification criteria. We need another modality like MRI. So the MRI is also very important, especially for the early case. So we recommend MRI for those patients with uncertainty on conventional X-ray. And we recommend two sequences for T1 weighted or STIR sequence is much more important in SPA. Let me show you the picture here. For STIR, STIR is active, uh, actually a T2 sequence with fat set, fat suppression sequence, so that you can see acute information sign by say subchondral bone edema over here. And sometimes you can see the uh, enhanced signal over the ancestors or synovitis. So we define by more than two lesions in one slice or more than slice, you can make a positive active information of SPA. Then in, you do the T1 uh, weighted image to see the chronic change. That means the structure damage by the subchondral fat metamorphosis, fat deposition. 
And later on, you will see some um, new bone formation or even the ankylosis in the long run. And we don't recommend MRI for all patients with number spine, only for differential diagnosis, because it should be, um, it should be later on in the late stage, you can see the spine change. But again, you can see the, some sign of acute inflammation in the third sequence over the corner, which is the ligament insertion to the vertebral body. I think this is the, the more specific sign for corner encephalitis. We also recommend CT in some patient if MRI is not available or if MRI is too expensive or for example, in Taiwan insurance. So in that condition, you can do CT, but um, preferentially we recommend a low radiation, low dose CT to, expo uh, to decrease the radiation exposure. For CT it's much easier to read. If you compare the right side and left side, you can see the left side, you have clear bony erosion and subchondral sclerosis compared to the relative normal right side. And CT is also useful for differential diagnosis, the OCI, which is quite common in young adult due to trauma or due to the, uh, the other benign course. And finally, I still recommend low dose CT in each, each hospital because this is available right now. So you can use a very, very low compared to KUB is actually quite similar to KUB and plus some AI algorithm, you can make the image very, very beautiful to look at the early erosion of structural damage. So the summary of this part is the, the selection flow of image. So the essential is still the conventional X-ray from the start for every patient with back pain for more than three months. And then if the patient is still uncertain, you should go for CT, or MR, and in most European country or USA, they recommend MRI only. But in Asia country or Taiwan or China, I think low dose CT is also another alternative choice. Then how to access the disease activity and also the structural damage severity. And we do have some patient reported outcome available. Again, there is no single biomarker. Even CRP and ESR is non-specific. Even IgA, calprotectin, those are non-specific and also insensitive. So the gold standard right now is still patient-reported outcome, including the patient global assessment. Or you can just ask the pain scale from zero to 10. But I rec recommend a more specifically index we call the BAS die, the BAS AS disease activity index composed by six clinical questions reported by the patient. So you just ask, ask them about the fatigue, zero to 10, or spinal pain, peripheral pain, morning stiffness, et cetera. Then you have a BAS die score. And more recently, we have another new index called ASTAS, which is a AS disease activity score plus CRP. And we also have an image score for MRI for act activity, but this is not well um, validated right now. So the gold standard right now is still BASDI and ASTAS. So let me show you the ASTAS. You can download from the ASTAS website again. They even have different language version, including, including Chinese traditional or Chinese simplified. So the ASTAS is composed by four clinical questions, as you can see here, and plus one serum CRP. So you can get a exact score. And that's goal we have validated for treatment target. We have set a treatment target for 2.1. So if a patient uh, more than 2.1 is high disease activity, that will be treat you, uh, guide your treatment uh, strategy. Can I go back? Sorry. Okay, for ASTAS, less than 2.1 is low disease activity. 
but the treatment target will be inactive, which is less than 1.3. And finally, the structure damage, the gold standard right now is only MSAS. It's a scoring score by conventional X-ray of lateral view of your spine. You can score from zero to three for each vertebra, and you have a total score of zero to 72. But again, this is very insensitive and very subjective. So you don't need to do that within two years because it's a slow progression disease. But the X-ray can do very good um, differential diagnosis between AS or the other common disease, which is DISH. I'm sure Dr. Zhang is an expert of DISH. You can see this quite commonly yeah, in, in rehab or in aged patient. You should do that differentiation because it's a different disease. This is a benign degeneration of the anterior longitudinal ligament, which is totally different from SPA. For SPA, you can see the earlier sign of a syndesmophy or corner shining sign or the squaring of the vertebral body. And in the late stage, you can see the bamboo spine, which is the bridging syndesmophy. So finally, I'll give you some practical guidelines for clinical and image diagnosis. So I like ASAS because ASAS is still the world um, collaboration in axial spa and also peripheral spa. They published the guideline for clinical diagnosis. So for patient with chronic back pain, you just do the X-ray. If you can see clearly bilateral grade two or unilateral grade three, then you can make a diagnosis of AS. But if the X-ray is negative or uncertain, then you should go back to collect more clinical features such as IBP or NSAID response or peripheral arthritis and societies, ductilitis, et cetera. Then if you have four or more SPA features, then you got the diagnosis. You don't need another biomarker. You even don't need a HLA-B27. So again, four is our consensus right now for clinical diagnosis. But if you only have two to three, then you need a laboratory, especially HLA-B27. If B27 positive, then you get a diagnosis. Yes, it's non-radiographic access bar. But if B27 negative, no. So then the conclusion is to consider other diagnosis. But in some case, you only have one SPA features or even zero, then you need B27 and also the image information, especially MRI, to get a diagnosis of a non-radiographic axial spot. So this is a global consensus, but we think in Taiwan or in Asia country, we should have a different situation because of the availability of tests or the cost. So we do publish that guideline. We raise up a different role of CT. You can see the X-ray, B27 and MRI, which is the similar part to ASAS guideline. But in our Taiwan consensus, we add the CT before some cases of MRI. In case of the MRI is unavailable or the cost issue. So I'll give you my conclusion that the clinical diagnosis should base on mainly clinical features. And image modality are very useful in diagnosis and monitoring disease activity, especially the conventional X-ray of SI joint and spine. If X-ray is not conclusive, then you should consider MRI or CT, especially low dose CT. For disease activity assessment, we recommend ASTAS CRP and BASDI. For chronic structural damage, right now we only have MSAS validated. So this is my final slide. I give you a famous word from Sir William Osler. He said that medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. This is totally true in the area of rheumatic disease, especially spondylo astropathy. So clinical medicine is really a science plus art. With that, I thank you for your attention.
So I'm very appreciative for Dr. Wei's uh, presentation. Uh, any question? I don't know what question. For okay. You. Because you have shown the one slide that uh, I, uh, ASP, long term follow up IBD, you have 2%. Yes. It uh, seems to be high because IBD in, 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 in I mean, in Chinese population seems to be lower than Caucasian, as I remember. Yes. So from the Dr. Wang, Professor Wang in, in the Chengong uh, Dajie, uh, he collected 1,000 AS patients and only four patients with IBD. So the, the, the prevalence are about 0.4%. Uh, so, but you have 2%. So that's different. And the, the other one is the IBD seems to be severe in those four cases with uh, AS. So you have yes. any comment for this? Uh, Very good question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just as I said, yeah, we, we think IBD is quite rare in Asia country. But when you look at the big data, you have a very big sample size. And we also do the subgroup analysis. So if you see the figure I showed you before, if you look at the age less than 40, mm -hmm. that is a subgroup analysis, mm -hmm. which is much more higher, up to 2%. Oh. But for overall, it's not so high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, you need to do sub high risk patient, which is especially for younger than 40 years old. IBD is severe in, in AS patients. I mean, the AS, uh, if they have the IBD, so they have a more severe, like a bamboo span, more, more, more common, or hip joint involved. Because from Dr. Wang's uh, yeah. report, yeah. that uh, there are four patients, four patients yes. received the total hip replacement. So that seems. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah. Most of the patients with EAM will actually more mm. severe in musculoskeletal disease also. Mm. But this is not the, 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 all, all the rule. Because I only have a patient, two or, or more with AS as IBD. One is severe form, and mm. one is another one is mild form. Mm. But generally, yeah, those are more severe. Okay. Any question? Uh, uh, the last two questions. Uh. As you mentioned, the, the SI joint image reading is very subjective. Uh -huh. And so did you try uh, before uh, used to use uh, the overview of the pelvis to read the SI joint? Very good question, yes. Yeah, we discussed this in our consensus. You have oblique view, you have Vergesen view, you have AP view, uh -huh. and in some countries you do PA view. Mm. Okay. But um, most of the experts in ASAS they agree only for pelvis AP view. You don't need to do oblique view, no. The only exception is some patient with normal variation, very strange angle, you might need to do that. But mm -hmm. generally, uh, AP view is okay for baseline diagnosis. Okay, sure question, the last one. So yeah, yeah. So he is our medical student. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. And I would like to ask Professor, uh, for the X-ray criteria or CT criteria, does the bilateral sacroiliitis always necessary? Because while reviewing the medical, uh, electronic medical records in our hospital, we found that most a lot of patients are diagnosed of uh, AS, but they only have grade two one yes. side okay. sacroiliitis. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. I'm very curious about this. For, <laughs> okay. For Thank you. Time. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, the button is the, the whole spectrum of axial spa. You don't need to a X-ray evidence, no, because axial spa including AS and non-radiographic. For AS, yes, you need bilateral grade two. For non-radiographic, no, you only need MRI. Okay, so mm -hmm. that is a by definition, but again, it's only a definition. You have no clear cut on, on that. Okay, Thank you. Uh, please give a big hand for uh, Professor Wei's presentation. <laughs>